Welcome to Cinematic Excrement. In my last video, I left you hanging before revealing my number one most hated movie of 2015. Well, the day for the big reveal has finally come. This is the big loser. This is the bottom of the barrel. This is the type of movie that will have you questioning the value of human life. Because if humanity could make something so horrible, does it really deserve the existence that God gave it? It's possible I'm being a little overdramatic, but anyway, here it is. My number one worst movie of 2015 is... What? What do you mean they... Oh, God damn it! Well, that ruins the surprise! Just, couldn't you have put some question marks in the title or something? Ugh. All that build up for nothing. Oh well, obviously it's Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, I couldn't avoid this one forever, though I very much wish I could, and I really should be able to because by all rights, this movie should not exist. I still do not understand how this fucking story became so popular. But here we are. Here we are. So let's take a look at how we got here. Oddly enough, it started right where this show started. Twilight. Before it was a movie, and even before it was a book, Fifty Shades of Grey began life as Master of the Universe, an online fanfiction novel based not on He-Man, as the title might lead you to believe, but on Stephanie Meyer's terrible stories about vampires. The story was written by one Erica Mitchell under the pseudonym Snow Queen's Ice Dragon, which is such a silly name, I don't even think I need to make up a joke for it. Using essentially the same characters and plot from Twilight, but with BDSM instead of vampires. And a seriously fucked up interpretation of BDSM relationships to boot. But we'll get into that later. At some point, a publishing house took interest in the story for God only knows what reason, and since they obviously couldn't publish the story as is without getting sued, Mitchell changed all of the characters' names and a few minor details to avoid any copyright infringement. And thus, Fifty Shades of Grey was published in 2011, this time with Mitchell using the pseudonym E.L. James. And unlike most movies I review which are based on books, I did actually read the book this time. The things I go through to entertain you people. I've been told that the book had multiple grammatical errors when it was first published, but at least in the Kindle version, which is what I read, these mistakes appear to have been largely corrected. But it's still a complete mess. It's clunky, it's repetitive, there's no real plot to speak of, the dialogue is awful, I don't think the author understands how real people actually talk, and she'll occasionally throw in a few words like loquacious or solicitously to make the writing seem more intelligent than it really is. Clearly she was writing with Microsoft Word open in one window and thesaurus.com in the other. The sex scenes, of which there are many, read like a really bad porno. And it goes on and on for 500 freaking pages and it's just horribly dull. However, there are moments here and there where it gets unintentionally hilarious. The entire book is presented from the point of view of Anastasia Steele instead of Isabella Swan, note the same number of syllables. They also both have two syllable nicknames, Anna, Bella. And Anna's inner monologue is so ridiculous. She is very fond of the word crap. The word crap appears 87 times in the book, 87 freaking times. Anytime something bad happens, it's either crap or double crap or holy crap. And on very rare occasions, she will bust out the triple crap. It makes me wonder if she's supposed to be Bella Swan or Strong Bad. I think the only word that shows up more often than crap is flush. A hundred freaking times this bitch flushes. She's always flushing. I mean her face, not the toilet. She's also constantly going on and on about two voices in her head, her subconscious and her inner goddess, which is basically what she calls her sex drive. I'm not kidding. She mentions these two so often it borders on schizophrenia. But he's no literary hero, not by any stretch of the imagination. Is Grey, my subconscious asks me, her eyebrow figuratively raised? I love how she feels the need to spell out figuratively. No, my subconscious is not a real person with real eyebrows. Stop! Stop now! My subconscious is metaphorically screaming at me, arms folded, leaning on one leg and tapping her foot in frustration. Metaphorically, again, her subconscious is not actually a real person. 
My subconscious glares at me, wagging her long, skinny finger, then morphs into the scales of justice to remind me he could sue if I disclose too much. Hmm, no metaphorically or figuratively this time. Does this mean she literally morphs into the scales of justice? Her inner goddess is even more hilarious. My inner goddess glares at me, tapping her small foot impatiently. My inner goddess is doing the meringue with some salsa moves. My inner goddess sits in the lotus position, looking serene except for the sly, self-congratulatory smile on her face. My inner goddess jumps up and down with cheerleading pom-pom, shouting yes at me. My inner goddess pole vaults over the 15-foot bar. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Little moments like that almost made the book bearable. Almost. Unfortunately, none of this silliness is in the movie. We don't get to hear what's going on in Anna's head. So all we're left with is the basic plot, which is rather troubling because, as previously stated, there is no plot. It's just two hours of nothing. And sex. And nothing. And sex. And nothing. And sex. And you get the idea. And yet, the book somehow sold 125 million copies worldwide. And the movie made over half a billion dollars on a budget of 40 million. And it got an Oscar nomination. Granted, the nomination was for Best Original Song, so that doesn't actually say anything about the movie itself. But still, this piece of shit can rightfully say it got an Oscar nomination. Is there no justice in this world? What little story there is centers around the aforementioned Anastasia Steele, played by Dakota Johnson, and filthy rich dude Christian Grey, played by Jamie Dornan. And boy, does he really like the color gray, judging by his collection of neckties. So does the director, for that matter. The movie seems to have a gray tint going on. Methinks they're taking this just a little too far. Anna is a college student who is interviewing Christian for her school paper, and the instant they meet, the sparks start flying. I'm not really sure why, as she doesn't make the best of first impressions. <gasps> Ladies and gentlemen, the shock master! 10 bonus points if you got that joke. Eventually, Christian turns this boring interview around and tries to find out more about Anna. Good luck with that, buddy. I've watched this movie several times and I still don't know shit about Anna. There's really not much to know about me. Much like her Twilight counterpart, Bella Swan, Anna is practically a blank slate. We know she likes literature and like Bella, we know she's clumsy, but that's really it. We don't know of any hobbies or interests apart from books and we have no idea why every guy she meets falls head over heels in love with her. Oh yeah, there's that too. Again, just like Bella Swan, every guy under the sun wants her. From Christian, to her coworker at the hardware store, to her ethnic best friend Jose, who's basically the Jacob counterpart, they're all beating down her door to get them some Anastasia steel. Why? Well, I think the answer is obvious, because this is how the author wishes men saw her. Take note, Ray haters. This is what a Mary Sue looks like. Anyway, getting back to Anna and Christian. We offer an excellent internship program. I don't think I'd fit in here. Look at me. I am. Run! Great Caesar's ghost, 10 minutes into the movie and I already feel unclean. How could anyone be turned on by this? This is fucking creepy. And that's just the beginning. It gets even worse the next day when he unexpectedly shows up at the hardware store she works at. Oh, what a coincidence that he just happened to shop at that particular store in Portland when he lives and works in Seattle. Yeah, it's pretty clear he's stalking her. But the character is based on Edward Cullen, so what would you expect? And his stalker behavior is not helped at all by that empty, emotionless facial expression, which, by the way, is the only one he has throughout the entire movie. I honestly have no idea if that was a directorial choice, or if he lacks the acting ability to do anything else, or maybe he realized he was in such a terrible movie and just couldn't be bothered to give a shit. In any case, Christian asks Anna for a few specific items, and even she is starting to figure out there's something seriously weird about this guy. Rope, tape, cable ties. You're the complete serial killer. Ding, ding, ding! We have a winner! Not today. Not today? The fuck you mean, not today? On any other day, would you be a serial killer? Is today your day off? 
Now, any sensible human being would stay far, far away from this creeper, but Anastasia Steele is not a sensible human being. She wants Christian Grey in the worst way. And spoiler alert, that's pretty much what she gets. And neither the book nor the movie even attempt to hide how superficial Anna's attraction to Christian is. She wants him because he's hot. That's it. Well, and the fact that he's filthy stinking rich doesn't hurt him either. This is Mitchell's ultimate fantasy romance. You know, I'm starting to think she might not be a very good person. But even though Christian wants Anna as much as she wants him, he warns her to stay the hell away. Kinda sounds like what Edward told Bella in Twilight. And he saves her from getting run over. Again, kinda like Twilight. He also plays the piano, like Edward did in Twilight. Hell, with the tint this movie uses, it even looks like Twilight. Are you sensing a pattern here? It's one thing to be inspired by another work, it's another thing entirely to copy it outright. And yet, E.L. James has the nerve to refer to Christian and Anna as iconic characters. They're not iconic, they're borderline plagiaristic. I don't have the strength to stay away from you anymore. Then don't. I'm incapable of leaving you alone. Then don't. Yeah, it's pretty much the same story. Well, there is one little difference. Like Edward Cullen, Christian Grey has a dark and terrible secret. But he's not a vampire. His secret has more to do with his sexual desires. My tastes are very singular. I like to use marmalade as a lubricant. No, actually what he's into is much scarier. In his apartment, he has what Anna refers to as a red room of pain. Good lord, he really is the complete serial killer. This is the kind of thing that would make anyone run for the hills, except Anna because she's seriously fucked in the head. Christian wants Anna to be his submissive while he plays the role of the dominant, and they can have lots of weird kinky sex inside his little torture chamber. Okay, here's the thing. I know a lot of people out there are into BDSM, and I promise I am not here to judge you. It's not really my thing, but if you and your consenting partner enjoy it and know how to do it safely, go for it. Knock yourself out. But the relationship between Anna and Christian in Fifty Shades of Grey is not how BDSM works in the real world. There's a difference between a dominant-submissive relationship and an abuser-victim relationship. If anyone watching this video has more experience in this area, by all means correct me if I'm wrong. But as I understand it, in a dom-sub relationship, it's actually the sub that is in control. Sure, the dom appears to have control, but this control is an illusion. The dom only has as much control as the sub allows. The sub makes the rules, sets the limits, and decides when to say no. The dom is more of a guide than a commander. Oddly enough, while he doesn't say this in the movie, Christian does actually spell this out for Anna in the book. But even a cursory look at his actions will show he doesn't really believe this. Christian doesn't want the illusion of control, he wants actual control. He flat out says so the first time he meets Anna. Oh, I exercise control in all things, Miss Steele. He wants to dominate Anna completely. Not just in the bedroom, but in every aspect of her life. He wants her to sign an NDA, preventing her from discussing any aspect of their relationship with anyone. He wants to control what clothing she wears and what doctor prescribes her birth control. He wants to determine how often she sleeps, exercises, drinks, and eats, as well as what she eats. He has this really weird obsession with keeping her well-fed. It's bizarre. You. Me to eat. And he wants Anna to sign a contract to enforce all of his rules and regulations for their relationship. A fucking contract! And of course, the contract doesn't say anything about how often he sleeps and eats or anything like that. It's all about controlling Anna. This is not how BDSM works. This is not how any personal relationship works. What would I get out of this? Me. And by me, I mean... my dick. And my wallet. Yeah, that's pretty much the only thing Anna gets out of this. All of her expenses are covered by Christian, and he lavishes expensive gifts upon her. Like a new car! <laughs> this is a moment where Christian gets especially controlling. He apparently doesn't like the old VW bug Anna drives because he thinks it's unsafe. And, well, okay, he's not wrong, that car is a death trap. But he not only buys her an expensive new car, but sells her old one right out from under her which I'm pretty sure is not legal. 
And she has not signed the contract at this point, by the way. Not that it would matter if she did. There's no way that thing would be legally enforceable, but still, that's kind of a dick move. Christian doesn't want a submissive, he wants a sex slave. And in exchange for her sex, he throws money at her. There's a word for that. The movie tries to make Christian more sympathetic, tries being the key word, by explaining he's all kinds of fucked up because he had an unhappy childhood with his crack whore mother. He was also apparently seduced by an older woman when he was 15, and this woman introduced him to this extremely fucked up version of BDSM. I'm sure that kind of upbringing would be traumatizing, but that does not excuse his ass hattery. He'll get no sympathy from me. And while this isn't spelled out as explicitly in the movie as it is in the book due to the lack of Anna's inner monologue, she knows Christian is bad news. She knows he's a control freak. She knows he wants to hurt her and will take pleasure in doing so but she just can't bear to part with him. This is how an abuse victim thinks. But Fifty Shades portrays this relationship between an abuser and his victim as erotic. That's fucking horrible. Fortunately, Anna does not sign Christian's contract and ends up giving him the boot when he takes things a little too far during one of their sexy times. Stop. No. Sit, stay, down boy. So I guess the movie isn't all bad, since Anna does eventually figure out staying with Christian is a terrible idea. But then again, there are two more books that they are also turning into movies, and from what I've read on Wikipedia, she eventually marries the asshole. So much for that. This is one incredibly messed up movie. Compared to the book, it's better in some ways and worse in others. They tried their damnedest to remove some of the stupidity from the book, like Anna's overuse of the word crap, for example. In fact, I don't think she says crap once in the entire movie. They also changed the name of Christian's company to Grey House, which sounds much less stupid than Grey Enterprises Holdings Incorporated. Which is it, Enterprises or Holdings? They also made a few minor adjustments to Anna's character to make her seem a bit less of a pushover, like when her mother says she won't make it to Anna's college graduation. In the book, Anna just kinda goes with it. But in the movie, she's clearly bothered by this and tries to talk her mother out of skipping graduation. This reaction makes much more sense. They also cut down on the amount of sex. Now don't get me wrong, there's still enough sex in this movie for it to be borderline softcore porn and really bad porn at that. There is nothing sexy about this sex, believe you me. But at least they got rid of some of the more graphic moments, including one involving a tampon. And for the sake of anyone who has eaten recently, I am not going to elaborate on that. But like I said before, the movie is also missing Anna's inner monologue. And while that does remove a lot of the stupidity, it also removes a lot of the unintentional comedy. That's not to say the movie doesn't have funny moments. There are a few, like when Anna and Christian are negotiating the terms of the contract and Anna asks him to clarify a few things. What are butt plugs? <laughs> I'm sorry, that gets me every time. But overall, the movie is a combination of boring and creepy and its portrayal of an abusive relationship as romance is downright sickening. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I have finally found a love story worse than Twilight. Congratulations, E.L. James, you did it. I hope you're proud of yourself. And that was my worst movie of 2015. And thank God that's over with. Next time, we're going to take a look at something much more fun. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Strike out vaginal fisting, too. Are you sure? Yep. Yeah.